So good, so good, so good. Thank you, Jesus, for your blessings. I, I, I do feel like the Lord has led me to this word today. Uh, he got me up early, and I was planning on going back to bed, and the Lord said, son, no. We got some work to do. So I believe that God has given me this, and I hope that it will release the way that I have felt it and that I can just get out of the way and God can just use me to speak this word today. And I pray it's a rhema for you. Genesis 3, 1 through 12 is where we're going for our text. I debated whether I was going to take a text today. And I'm going to ask the media team to help me because I did not put it in my iPad. But I want to talk to you for a few minutes about hide or seek. And we'll read this scripture together. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Everybody say he was crafty. And I don't mean Home Depot crafty. Wait, not Home Depot. Whatever that place is. Hobby Lobby crafty. He wasn't Hobby Lobby crafty. He was wise. He was serpent. He was a serpent that was very subtle and very, very sneaky. So he always had that. He said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. The devil will always take God's words and twist them just a little bit, but even just a little bit makes it a lie. Is it all right if I talk through this word? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Didn't he say that? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God had to place something in the garden that allowed man to choose him or choose their will and their desire. And the serpent, we'll say more about that in a minute. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Does anybody know when a serpent crawls up, any woman that thinks I want to have a conversation with that snake? <laughs> There's t Most women go look for the first piece of furniture, Right? So I'm wondering if this serpent was more approachable. He said, For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. That's the first lie the devil always tells you. You're being left out of something. God's keeping something from you. And it is a lie, brothers and sisters. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the eyes right there, and that it is pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life. She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her. Notice that Adam was standing right there, and he did eat. And the next verse says, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were what? Well, someone... Someone didn't have to tell them. They knew. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Some people believe they didn't eat an apple. They ate a fig because the size of fig leaves would make for sewing together for, for clothes. And the fact that it was so close. And they heard the voice of the Lord. Everybody say voice. Of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid, everybody say hid, themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice, thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Everybody say afraid. Because I was naked. Say naked one more time. And I hid myself. He said, I heard your voice. I was afraid. And I hid myself. And I believe God is telling us today, come out, come out wherever you are. I believe there's some things that God wants to deal with. With the voice of God in our life. With the fear that we have in our life with who we really are, the nakedness of who we are before God and the places that we hide things. And that's what we're going to speak about for a few minutes. You are either hiding things or you are seeking God. 
and you're finding the hidden things of God. It's one or the other. You get to choose which one you are going to be. You're either going to hide from God and hide things in your life and hide yourself sometimes, or you're going to seek God and find all that he can be for you and make you all he wants you to be. Jesus, we love you today. We come before you with this word. It is your living and powerful and anointed word. We ask you to help us to impart it in a way that lives in us. Set us free, Lord Jesus, in mind and heart and body in this word. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. How many know hide-and-go-seek? How many played hide-and-go-seek when you were a kid? Awesome. Hide-and-go-seek was, well, for millennials here, um, I have to explain what hide-and-go-seek is because you have devices with batteries and apps. But hide-and-go-seek was the poor, the game for poor kids, okay? You would go outside, you would all get together, you would find a big tree, and someone would hide their face in the tree and begin to count as the others ran to hide You'd go looking for a place where you could not be found. And whoever was the last person hiding was the person that won. And there was always one person put against the tree, and they began to count one, two, three. And then ready or not, here I come. Yeah, you got it. You've done it. You've played it. So you know, it was typically a game that you were sent out to play. You know, your mom wanted you out of the house. My mother would send us out. It was kind of a problem, though, because I lived in Alaska, and so you couldn't really say go out and come back when the street lights come on, because that would be midnight or 1 a.m. On, on the summers, so in the summer. So we had late night summer games, but uh, not that late. I enjoy, I enjoyed it. I used to, we actually played at our house in Muskego when we were playing Capture the Flag. We would also hide we would dress in black clothes and play in the dark so you could hide better. It was, it was a whole nother level of hide-and-go-seek. I mean, we adults even played it. We would, oh, it was the best. We would sneak. We would paint our faces. We're winning this hide-and-seek. It was, it was hide-and-seek on steroids, okay? Sometimes, even though we laugh at the fun of it, I want you to know that sometimes we do that in our own spirits, in our own hearts. Because we're concerned what people will think of us if we be real. But I want to tell you at the onset of this sermon that God cannot bless. God will not bless the fake you. God cannot. He is a spirit of truth. Amen? God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, some people are all spirit. They're just ooga booga, thank you, you know, talk in tongues till, you know, they're, they're all spirit. They're, they get whacked out in the spiritual side of things. But God said, you have to have spirit and you have to have my word. You have to have truth. You have to be balanced, amen? God dislikes an unbalanced person. Not that he doesn't love you, but he dislikes an unbalanced weight. So he wants his people to be balanced, and in that he is helping us to live in spirit and in truth, he's also, through that spirit, not able to endorse something that is a lie. So if you're propping up something, if you're pretending to be something, if you're hiding beside or behind a facade, God cannot bless your facade, brothers and sisters. Uh, this might not be Jesus. I'm I'm need some help here today. It's so quiet already. This is going to be an awkward sermon for me, but hopefully it'll be a sermon that changes you. He did not ask. He did not ask. Where are you, Adam? Because he did not know where he was. And no matter how much you try to hide from God, you cannot hide from Him. He knows right where you are. And even though you don't want to necessarily show everyone your struggles and your, your downfallings and the places where you need grace, I understand that. But I also want you to know he asks you to come out of hiding is what he does. 
walking in the cool of the day where he would meet Adam. And Adam heard his voice. Voice represents the authority of God. Some people have problems with authority because they have hidden sin in their life. Some people have problems coming to church because they don't want to deal with the things they like to do in the dark. And the church is a bright light, amen? It's a city set on a hill. And when you come here, you feel God's light, and it lights up your life, and you get to see that there are things that you have to address and things you have to deal with, and, and there are spots, and there's cleansing that he wants to do. And some people are uncomfortable with that because they want to keep the things they have hidden in the dark. Men love darkness because their e deeds are evil, the Scripture says. But we are children that walk in the light. We came out of darkness. But the devil would want nothing more than for you to hide things in the dark places of your life while trying to live as a Christian or as a man or woman of the light. He wants you to get all tied up and all bound up and all, and all twisted up trying to walk with God while having things in the closet. Amen? That is his desire. He wants to get your eyes looking at things you shouldn't and your heart desiring things that shouldn't and, and get the pride of life rising up in you where you want to climb the ladder of success and get bigger and better things. And he wants to, to work your life over to where you're so bound up, you're trying to live for God, but you can't because there's things in your life that you have hidden away. And so... When they had hidden their sin by sewing together fig leaves, they were driven by fear. Fear is a very driving thing in our lives. We don't sometimes understand how much the voice of fear tries to speak to us, but I come against it in the name of Jesus right now. And I release faith in the name of Jesus over fear. Because when you're running driven by fear, you do things that do not make sense. You will run after things that will not help you. You'll chase relationships that will not encourage you. You will get stuck in things that will get you down in the mire and get you pulled down in your mind and heart. And you will not have the fulfillment that that thing promised you because you ran to it because of the fears in your life. I want you to hear me today that the devil advertises things all the time. But when you get a hold or take and let those things take root in your life or you or you are in your desires, you give away to your desires and you, you take a hold of that thing and you try it, I guarantee you every single time it is not what it has been advertised to be. I promise you the joy, the happiness, the peace, it's not there. It is only found in Christ Jesus. It is only found in seeking the Lord. Seek him while he may be found, the scripture says. If you ask, keep asking. If you knock, keep knocking. If you keep seeking, you will find. The scripture promises us that. Seek him with all your heart, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh, and your life will not be full of fears. It's so difficult to live two lives. A life with things of darkness and a life in the light. God does not want you to live that way. He wants you to be naked before him. And that's why he asked the question, Adam, where are you? I don't know this church boy you're pretending to be, Adam. I don't know this facade you've put up. I don't know what these, le these leaves that you put together. It doesn't even make sense. You're running on fear. You've sewn together an apron of fig leaves when you pulled them off the vine, they started dying. It's all going to disintegrate. Everything you try to cover yourself with will never hold up. You are meant to be covered by heaven. You are meant to be covered by the blood of the lamb. That is the only thing. Eternal stuff is what was supposed to cover your life. And it keeps back fear and it keeps back uh, things that you would have in struggling and, and troubles and trials in your life. It will hold those things back. And it'll help you, but you have to be real. Everybody say, get real. I, I, I do know this. I do know that as a young man going through a lot of things that I went through, that the Lord would ask me, 
Are you being real with me? Are you being real right now? And God knows the answer. He knows the, uh, the interior of our hearts. He knows exactly who we are and what we're doing. He, he put man in a garden in an environment where things were perfect. And, and, and even when I thought things were going perfect in my life and like I, I was walking with God the best I could, he would come and he'd tap me on the shoulder and he said, hey, there's something in here I want to deal with. He's always working on you. He's always making you better. He's always doing the best for you even when he's correcting you. He's making it better for you. And it's not easy to be corrected. I know that. But I do want you to know that when he's correcting you, discipline from God builds you into a disciple for him. You cannot be a disciple for Jesus Christ unless you have disciplines. And we have found out through the garden story here that when man is given everything, it leads to trouble. You, know, you, you don't become, let me talk to the guys for a minute. You don't become a good man when you're just allowed to do everything. Men become men when they decide what they will not do. There are some things in your life you just simply should never do. You should never be driven by lust. You should never be driven by other sins. You should never be driven by greed. Those are things that make a man's maturity and make a man into a man of God. Amen, somebody? Men need to have boundaries. We have to have disciplines. The truth of the matter is you're loved through discipline. You feel love through discipline. Did you know that? If you have children or if you've raised any children, you know that they check all the doors to see if they're locked. They will push every single one of your buttons. Hello, somebody. I've got some witnesses in the house. But they want to know that when you say no, it means no today, and it means no tomorrow, and it means no when they're screaming in the grocery store, and it means no when they're happy. My kids have stories of dad, dad stories. And when we sit around for a while, they'll start telling dad stories, and they kind of sound, make me sound like I'm an ogre. Just stomp it around the house, just, oh, stop doing that. Turn that light off. Why are you running water when we don't need to run it? And even when I tell the stories, I sound like an ogre. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy, you know, classic dad stuff. Why is there a light on in the living room and we're all in the kitchen? Sister Carla, I have a story from Sister Carla about that. But even though they're telling stories about me being, you know, the disciplinarian, they're happy. We were going to the bank one time. And uh, the kids had spilt some stuff. They had some food in the back, and they had spilt the stuff in the back of the seat. And I was just, oh, I was livid. They weren't paying attention, and they made a mess. And I was going to have to clean it up when I got home. And I was like, that's it. No more food in the car. I made a declaration. Okay, This is it. Spilling stuff on my car. I think French fries and chicken nuggets were going everywhere or something. I don't know what it was, but... I've lost what exactly got spilled, but I remember the story. And they remind me of this story all the time because they used this because it was a moment of hypocrisy. Anybody ever have one of those moments? Yeah, everybody's courageous enough to admit it, right? <laughs> and so I'm like, we're sitting at the bank, the teller's there, and I'm like, that's it. No more food in the car. And right as I say that, the drawer comes out from the bank with suckers for the kids. And I go, you guys want a sucker? <laughs> I wasn't going to show in front of the, no. And so they're like, Dad, you just said no more food. So now, like anytime something hypocrisy, some like, little hypocrisy comes up, like where I'm like, that's it, we're going to eat healthy. Anybody want pizza tonight? <laughs> they're like, no more food in the car. They yell that. Here's a, or they say, here, have a sucker. Here, have a sucker. That's what that whole story means in my house. But the truth of the matter is they're happy when they're telling those stories because they know they're loved if they're disciplined. And I hate to use my kids, and I apologize to them for that, but it's the only way I could communicate this moment. I was at uh, man camp, and when you're around guys at man camp, the, one of the quickest things that happens is they start asking you, what do you do for a living? And it all, the question comes at you different ways, like, hey, how do you pay for this? How do you pay for your hobbies? 
Well, they want to know what you do for a living, then you get judged and you get identified based upon what you do. So sometimes I tell them I'm a plumber or I'm a... And sometimes I tell them I'm a carpenter in training. Jesus does that. And I'm so thankful that God doesn't define me by what I do. He doesn't define me by the titles that the world gives me. I'm so grateful that he defines me by what his grace has done for me and what the cross has done for me. And I'm so grateful that he puts discipline and boundaries into my life and that establishes the things that will absolutely change my life. Amen? And so I'm grateful to God that he has given us not only the ability to have discipline, but the ability to know when he's disciplining us, it's going to turn out for our good. So God gave all but one tree in the garden. That tree is a tree of love. That tree is a tree of discipline. He was saying, I love you, but you have to have boundaries. If you're going to have a free will, you have to have fences. And we have to understand that we can't blow fences and think we're just free. We can't blow through boundaries that God sets and think, we're out having a day. We're outside. No, it's not like that. We are actually loosed and in danger when we get outside the covering and the boundaries of Almighty God. We are meant to be protected by the disciplines he put in our life. And that tree is the example of love. Why would God put a tree in a garden where man could fall? Because he has to know, A, that you choose him over everything else. So you have to be able to say, I won't do that because he told me not to, and I want to be in obedient relationship with him. And two, it's called discipline. And without discipline, you are not a healthy person, period. If you have no disciplines in your life, you will not be mentally healthy, and that is what we're dealing with in our world. The advancement of mental health difficulties in our world is because people are without boundaries and borders and hedges and care and cover from our God. Amen? Hallelujah. But because of one man, all fell. Romans 5, 8 through 12. You can read that whenever you want to, but I'm going to read it quickly here for you. And I know... I'd rather focus on verse 12. Can you jump to that? I'll come back to verse 8. If you could jump over, that'd be great. I want to give you a couple of scriptures that talk about hiding sin. Wherefore, by his one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That one man, when Adam and Eve ate, and when Adam specifically ate, Death passed upon all men. When I get to heaven, I'm going to give Adam one good slap. Just, it's just going to come out of nowhere. I'm just, I'm just going to Will Smith him once. Oh, I'm sorry. I tried not to put that joke in. Antonio, I tried so hard not to put the Will Smith joke in. But I'm going to Will Smith Adam one time. Just, hey, brother. That's for breaking the whole system right there. Now we got taxes and we got sin and disease and toil and thorns and problems and arguments and pride and dissension and butting of heads and all of this difficulty. Because of one man, sin was passed upon the whole world. But it's funny that we too, when we live a life that is so blessed, sometimes we have discontentment in our hearts. And they didn't want what God had given them. Whenever the serpent presented it, they felt they were left out. He said, you will be like God's. They didn't want the role that God had given them. Suddenly, there was this offering of something greater, and they were dissatisfied with the beauty and the perfect and everything that was given to them, all of it except for the one tree. They could eat of any tree in the garden they want to. They could, they could have done anything they wanted to. They could have, have laid and napped underneath any beautiful scenery. They could, they could have ridden on dinosaurs or whatever they could have done in the garden. I don't know what it was. but they And when that serpent spoke to them, they, they realized, 
realized and they got focused on the one thing that they couldn't do. And that's the thing the enemy does every single time. He'll take every single one of your blessings and he'll push it way off to the side and say, but look what you don't have. And he will get you focused and and get your mind so caught up that you command all your strength and worry on the things you don't have instead of all of these manifold blessings that God has put in your life. I want to tell you that that will lead you to the exact same situation. And while I make jokes about slapping Adam, God forgive me because I would do the exact same thing and I've done the exact same thing in my life where the enemy has spoke to me and has showed me things that are missing or not up to the snuff of everybody else or the filters that people put out there and I say well why don't I have those things? Why am I getting older and I'm not this far yet? I want to tell you that's a lie from the enemy. God knows right where you are and he knows how to give you everything that's been lost and he knows how to take you every place he wants you to be. He's a restorer of the canker worm and the palmer worm and he gives back everything that's lost. God is able to give you everything that you need and I want you to know that when you get focused on the wrong things it's the path that leads to sin brothers and sisters it's funny how the devil will hide all the blessings so that you'll get sin in your life and have to hide them from God Proverbs 28 13 says if you hide your sins you will not succeed if you confess and reject them you will receive mercy thank God he's merciful when we confess our sins to him Psalm 69 and 5 said, God, you know what I have done wrong. I cannot hide my guilt from you. Psalms 44, 20 through 21, it says, if, you had, if we had forgotten the name of our God or lifted our hands to a foreign God, wouldn't God find out since he knows the secrets of the heart? Psalms 90 and 8 says, you have set our wrongdoing before you, our secret sins in light, in the light of your face. Numbers 32, 23. But if you don't do these things, you will be sinning, you will be sinning against the Lord, knowing for sure that you will be punished for your sin. God knows everything, brothers and sisters about you, and he always watches. That's why we need to put it down in the name of Jesus. That's why we need to put every word and every action under the blood of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 16, 17 says, I see everything they do. Psalms 44, I already hit that. Thank goodness for copy-paste that doesn't work out. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. The way to get out of hiding sin is to humble yourself. To humble yourself. I pray that we would kneel before God in our hearts and our minds before we are forced to kneel before him someday. I pray that we kneel before him every single day and that he speaks light into our heart and the places where the stains are, the light shows, and we clean them with God's help with the blood of the lamb because sin will lead you to places that will cause you to hide more sin. But when you let it be washed away by the blood of the lamb, you become new and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Old things are passed away. Behold, all becomes new. Hiding away is a powerful tool of the enemy. We already talked about that because it keeps you isolated. There was a study that was done in the university, and they were watching zebras, and zebras have natural camouflage. How many know this is true? They're painted with stripes. Love zebras. Used to love them as a kid. Had a little toy zebra. And what they, feel, what they found out is that the pride of lions cannot attack a zebra until it's isolated from the herd because the lions do not have the capability of picking out one zebra when they're all together because the lines all run together. It's a camouflage of the group. So what they started to do is they were studying different zebras. They didn't realize they were doing this, of course, but they designed a way to stripe the zebras with red paint on their haunches, either back or front. And so they would stripe them with red paint so they could follow the zebra and tag them. But they found out when they striped a zebra, it always got attacked by the herd or by the pride of lions. 
because it pointed them out. And that's what the enemy tries to do. If he gets you hiding your sin, he gets you marked with sin. And then he can devour you like he desires to. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I want you to know that you have camouflage when you're in the church. Amen? You have camouflage when you're in God's hands. But when you start to sin and hide, it marks you in the spiritual world, and you become isolated, and you start to draw back and get away from the body of Christ because you have secret sins. I want you to know, I'm not, against, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, but I want you to know that the enemy will come after those that are isolated first. Amen? He won't attack us all together. He'll attack the ones that are all alone. And that is what we need to understand, is he's a roaring lion. He comes to steal. And he comes to what? And he comes to destroy. I don't want any part of that. How about you? I want to live in the joy and the peace and the overwhelming of God. We have to stop hiding things. They sewed fig leaves together. You know what that means? That means to me that they covered the most productive part of their body. And when you find out as a pastor, you start to live and walk with God and you start to work with people, I've noticed that their productivity goes down when they hide sin in their life. Their spiritual productivity goes down, their productivity in their own life. I can tell you this. That when you come to the Lord, all of a sudden you feel a freedom. You have this desire to do great things. It just comes over you. And you start to believe God for stuff you don't have finances for. You start to have vision for things that you can't possibly fulfill without God's help. It is true that when you shoulder off sin at the presence of God and in the, at the cross, God will put a powerful purpose inside of you that drives you every day. And you will not be driven by fear. You'll get up in the morning and say, bring it. You'll have this overwhelming spirit. You will hit the gym and you'll feel like a thousand, like you can lift a thousand pounds. You'll be like the clanking guy. Clank, clank. You got the whole rack. Just trying to keep you awake. It's not good to hide things. People know people's sins when things are hidden. It's called bait and switch. Have you ever seen that? Where they advertise something, you get there, and they switch it on you. Doesn't that aggravate you? Because it goes back to things that are hidden. But where are you, Adam, today? He was asking him because he wants us to come naked, not physically, but emotionally. This is what I'm getting to today. This is the substrata of what I'm trying to say. What he was afraid of when he heard the voice of the Lord was that he found out he was naked. I mean, why is that a problem, Adam? You've been naked the whole show. (laughs) Had no clothes on the whole time. Why are you afraid of that all of a sudden? He wasn't really afraid of being naked. He was afraid of the understanding that he was being seen naked. And that is the thing that we're afraid of. We're not afraid of what others will think of us. Some of us have a very, very large buffer. We have the ability to like, who cares? I could forget your mama ever had you. You know, some of us have really strong I don't care kind of attitudes. And like, I can, I, I can live life without your opinion, no problem. Even if you have an opinion, I don't care. You know, some of us have a real strong area, uh, ability to do that. But he understood that. God asks us to come completely open, completely naked, and emotionally available to God. And when you're not emotionally available to God, he cannot bless your life. You cannot be fake in his presence. I've already said that. The difference is he knew he was exposed and seen, and that's what changed everything. We have to be emotionally exposed to God, brothers and sisters. If you have emotional damage, he will heal it. I promise you. He will mend you. He will restore you. We have to give God the real us, amen? Fake is so over. Fake is so done. You've got to be real. We had such a movement 
and the non-denominational world and all throughout Christendom of being authentic. Everybody wanted to be authentic. And now you got people confessing their porn addictions and you got stuff, people confessing their sins to the wrong people. They shouldn't be saying it. They need to confess their sins to God. Amen. They need to take it to God. We, we grieve the Holy Ghost when we come in here and we pretend like we're something we're not. We need people who are willing to take down the walls and willing to take off the masquerade and say, this is who I really am. My marriage struggles. My life struggles. When I get on the freeway, I have anger problems. When I, when I do things that I don't know how to deal with, I'm scared of that person. Yes, I don't want to be the naked man in front of God, but it grieves God when we don't come open to him, when we don't understand that he wants the scared you. He wants the you that feels like you're not enough. He wants the you that would that feels like if they really know me, they won't love me. He wants the one that, sit, that sits inside of you that says, I can't impress them if I don't do it on the outside. He wants the one inside of you that says, what will they think of me if they know who I really am? He wants the one that says, if they only knew where I've been and what I've done, they would think completely different of me for the, last, for the rest of my life. And so many have hidden so much that they don't have a place to go with it. They don't know the power of the cross. They don't know the beauty that Jesus took his sin, all of our sin, to the cross. And he played hide and seek once and for all. See, it's all about a tree. Adam hid his face in the tree. And Jesus and God, or God came looking for him. But Jesus comes seeking us because he wants us. Even with all the things we've hid, Jesus wants us. He loves us. No matter what is keeping you, no matter what's hidden in your life, God wants you. So no matter what you've hidden, God becomes the seeker after you by sending a son, dying on a cross, and giving his life for you. I'm thankful for that because there's people that were high last night because of the things they're hiding. There's people that were drunk last night because of the things that they were hiding. There's people that lean towards sexual sin because of the stuff that they're hiding. And they've literally hid themselves sometimes from them, their own self because of all the things they're hiding. It's how I hide myself, the world says, because they have no place to hide themselves. But if we have a God who if we seek him, if we flip the script and we stop hiding in our sins, but we start seeking him, he will hide us in the shadow of the Almighty. He will give us his glory and we'll be able to walk with him. And no longer do we have to go find a high to take care of the things that we're hiding. No longer do we have to seek a bottle to find a peace from all the things that we're hiding. But now we seek him. Now we go after him and he hides us in his pavilion in his secret place. Flips the whole script and now we seek him that we might hide in him. God is so real to Adam. He's like, I don't want you to pretend like you didn't eat from that tree. Who told you you were naked? Who told you your identity's different? Who told you you're something unloved now? Who told you you needed to be afraid of the God that created you? God was saying, I want you to come and not pretend. I don't know if you've ever been in the moment where you thought God wouldn't love you if you really opened up. But I promise you, if you stop faking things, you start being real, a new life in Christ Jesus would become so prevalent in your life. I want to be real. How about you? I want to be real. God didn't die for your fake. You hear me, brothers and sisters? I'm trying to be as patient and kind as I can 
with people sometimes that I run out of mercy and I have to realize that God has more mercy than I could ever have. God has more grace than I could ever have for people as a pastor. He died for the fallen you. God can handle it. He already did on the cross. Do you understand that? But God commended his love toward us, not when we were holy, not when we were cleaned up, not when we had the tie on on Sunday, but he commended his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did that cross to buy your fake. He wants the real you. He wants you to take down the fake and give you, give him the broken parts of you. And he'll make a mosaic so beautiful out of you that people will call you the artwork of God. And when you get to heaven, God will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thanks for giving me all the broken pieces because now you're my masterpiece. The real you. Am I helping anybody today? I hope I am. I know this is heavy. I promise you I will go home and I will think over what I said in this pulpit and wonder if I did it right. But I give God the the self-conscious me. I give God the low self-esteem me. Not that I have a low self-esteem, but you understand what I mean. You need to give God the tired you. You need to give God the frustrated you. You need to give God the accidental, the person that accidentally cussed somebody out <laughs> in your head. And it didn't get out your lips, but you, you were using every Christian cuss word you had. God cannot bless it if you don't give it to him. God is good, amen? He did not shed blood for the person you're trying to hide. That's what I'm saying. And so, when we seek him, he hides us in beautiful places. He shows us the hidden things of his glory. The reason why people don't think it's beautiful to walk with God is because they've never tasted the secret places of the Most High. When you walk with God and you have a prayer life and you get into the Word and you just begin to dig... Yeah, it feels, it feels hard on the flesh. It's hard on the flesh. The closer I get to God, we're fasting 21 days right now, prayer and fast. The closer I get to God, the dirtier I feel. But you know what? That's my flesh talking. It's uncomfortable in the presence of God because there shall be no flesh that glorifies in the presence of God. Amen? There's no glory in the flesh, but the Spirit of God inside me woke me up at 2 this morning and said, let's get to prayer. I came off tired, but I don't care. I feel the presence of God in this house. And when God begins to move, there's only one question. He'll ask you, which way do you want to live? Do you want to hide? Or do you want to seek me? Seek him broken. That's what come boldly before the throne of grace means that you have the opportunity to seek him even when you're trying to come out of an addiction. You have the opportunity to seek him even when you don't have everything figured out. You have the opportunity to seek him even if you had no role models in your life that were good and you're trying to figure it out. You're trying to give your children discipline you never had so they can be healthy and whole. And I pray, I have so many notes, Lord, what happened? I will only give you, can you give me 10 more minutes? Is it too much? Have I lost your attention? The world knows discipline matters. The world knows that. I'm just going to touch this one more time. Dr. Campbell in a, in a magazine, we get all these magazines at work, and some of them are very liberal, and some of them are not. And the Huffington Post was there, and there's a, article in it, eight things or traits of children that have been disciplined. Number one, self-control and maturity. This is what discipline does. This is what boundaries does for kids. Self-control and maturity, you apply it to your life because I just want you to know that God was doing this with the tree in the Garden of Eden. He was giving Adam discipline. How many know that Adam didn't grow up a child? He came in as a man, and when he sinned, he had all the weight of leading his family without ever having a role model from child up. I believe he had supernatural wisdom, yes, but look at what, look at what discipline does. 
It gives self-control maturity. Emotional maturity teaches you to delay gratification. You don't get everything you want, and it gives you a structure in parenting and teaches children to keep their commitments even when they are no longer new and exciting. You finish what you started. Did your grandma ever told you that? You finish what you started? It's a principle of discipline. Disciplined children learn to do what is right even when they don't feel like it. Very important. Dr. Campbell also said, number two, they learn empathy when they're disciplined. Empathy makes them able to put themselves in the shoes of someone else's emotional experience, which allows them to develop and understand a genuine care and genuinely care, enabling them to help others from a place of purity in their life rather than helping someone to meet their own agenda. It makes children non-narcissistic. That's why we have so many men running around chasing women because they don't understand that. We have, we have terms like hate the game, not the player. Where do you think that comes from? It comes from someone who has not had discipline in their life or never had a role model that you don't mess with people's feelings. It's getting heavy, I know. I'm trying to lighten it up. Three, it gives them the desire to feel good. Disciplined parenting teaches children they can be good and children respond to that because becoming driven through their own behavior to maintain this state of internal well-being. Feeling good becomes their natural state, which they will reach for when their life gets off track. They want to get back to a good feeling. And when you apply that to training them up in the way they should go, they understand that their good feeling is attached to right living with God. You raise them up right. Number four, discipline teaches them to be responsible. Discipline teaches children to be motivated from within, to help around the house, the school, and the world at large because they see the value of contributing to the whole rather than just thinking of their own needs. It teaches people to be an asset, not a liability. It makes people more enjoyable to be around. Children with discipline are more apt to love themselves and to be able to receive compliments. They have an internal or they have an internal sense of confidence derived from within and not performance or outside validation based. In other words, they don't live for likes on social media. They don't live for others' approval. They don't get driven by others' opinions. They have an internal ability to validate. And we know that comes from God as well. They don't need the likes and they don't need the media See them, they see themselves as lovable and worthy of being loved and allow, that allows them healthy reception of compliments. All of this happens in discipline. This is what the tree in the garden did. It gave them a discipline of saying yes and no to something. You would think that the more you babied your children, the more you, oh, he's so cute. He's so cute. Little boo-boo, come here. You get easy claps from mama sometimes. And daddy is a whole lot more disciplinary sometimes. But you need to, the reason why there's two different personalities in the home and the reason why it's important for dads to stretch their children to do good and to make them perform and make them uh, try hard is because when you're stretched, you learn how to be a better person. And that is what the masculine role does. But instead... The more you discipline, instead of babying them, the more you discipline and set boundaries, the more they see themselves as worthy of love. Did you know discipline does that for your children? It makes them feel worthy of love. If you, if you never discipline them, you could pour all the love on them you want to. It's just a black hole. But if you discipline them and you love them, you love them with everything. When they come in the room, you light up. When they're younger, you just, like a dog, seeing the people, their loved ones come home, you just let your body show it. Just get excited and wag everything. 
It's what you do for kids when they're little up to about seven or eight. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, Father. And then they get to 13, 14, and 50, and then they want you to not be in the room at all. But when they're little, you not only discipline them, but you love them. It's a balance. Number six, it teaches them accountability. Disciplining children or having disciplined children are more likely to own up to their own mistakes and are more likely to make good choices because they desire to feel good. Ownership is not seen as shameful. Everybody say shameful. That's what the world teaches you. When you do something wrong, shame. But that's not what God teaches. He says you put discipline in place because it allows them to own up to the things that they've done wrong, but rather instead of shamefulness, but rather as an opportunity to practice good character. When they make a mistake, they own up to it because they realize it's an opportunity and it builds good character in them. It makes responsible children or responsible children are taught that being wrong in life is okay and a part of the process of getting life right. Is this okay? Oh, this is so heavy today. They respect authority. When you have discipline in their life, they respect authority. So they, they won't be all up in the face of the principal. They won't be cussing out their teacher. They won't be yelling at the cop when he pulls them over. Amen. They have a respect for authority because their first experience with authority was healthy authority in the home. Amen, somebody. I know I'm being a little bit dated right now, but we were taught, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And when you wanted something else, you said, may I have another cookie, please. You were taught to be respectful. Number eight, disciplined children are more happy. They are pleasant to be around, and they have an easier time making and sustaining relationships. They are liked by all age groups around them and tend to be the kids other parents wish their kids could be. This is all done by discipline, not by just lavishing love and never putting up fences. You've got to protect your children. When they blow a fence, they might think they're free, but they're unprotected. You've got to pull them back in and help them mend the fence and say, look, this is here not only to keep things out, but to keep you in. This is, this is protection for you. It's a blessing. It's a blessing for you because it keeps the dangers out. All of that comes from discipline. It's not hard for us to see how an almighty God properly disciplines his children. I just want to pause for a minute and say what a good father we have. What a great, great father we have. That he would put a tree in a garden, and the tree was in the garden, and even though they fell from a tree, Jesus rose on a tree, and he died for all of our sins. So he's calling us today. If I could just say time out, he's calling every one of us back to that hide-and-go-seek moment at the tree where you lay all of your sins down and everything that you're hiding because he says, I came seeking you. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? Discipline and relationship with him. I wonder if we can flip this over today and not have hide or seek as we choose it, but we have seek him and find him. I want to get real in his presence. How about you? There's so many things here that I'm going to skip over. I'm going to abbreviate. But I would tell you this, that you can seek him in his word. Just saw a study that said only about 3% of Christians read their Bible. This is Christians from Barna Institute. They only said about 3% of Christians that say they're Christian read their Bible throughout the week. Did you know that if you seek him in his word, you will find him? We are called to seek first the kingdom of God. And if you look in his word, you will find truths from his word. Scripture actually tells us something beautiful in Psalms 119 and 30. It says, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And I pray today that as we end this sermon, that when we seek God, 
we see God's face. When we see God, we don't look for his blessings, but we look for the one who sends the blessings. All throughout scripture, it says, who will seek my face? Seeking his face means that you lay before God, that you, you put everything aside and just focus on him, that you're not coming to God for what he gives you, but you're coming to God for face-to-face relationship. Somebody needs to get in their heart that I don't know what you're going to give me in life, Lord. I don't know what kind of blessings you're going to give in my life. And, I, and I think, I'm thankful that he commends his blessings toward us. I'm thankful for that. But I don't live for him to escape hell. I don't live for him for the blessings he puts in my life. I live for him to have relationship with God. Because when I look into his face, his glorious face, he shows me who I really am. And then I see. I see how he sees me. He doesn't see me as the first Adam, fallen, broken, hurt, and damaged goods. He does not see that when he looks at me. He sees the second Adam, which is a God in flesh, powerful example of healing and restoration. He looks at me as one who is whole and healthy and spiritually made new. Amen. You would just stand with me. All of the disciplines he puts in my life, I'm willing to be chastened by the Lord because I know it makes me and puts me in secret places with him. If you are not seeking, unfortunately, you're hiding. If you are not moving forward, you are declining. If you are not resting in the Lord, you are running from him somewhere in your heart. And I want to give him all of me. How about you? A double hockey sticks, all of ourselves. I want to seek him while he may be found, Scripture says. And in this moment, I pray that we get our joy back. I pray that we get our song back. I pray that we get our worship back. Because when you're hiding things, you're busy holding it back from everybody else. But when you let it all go, you're freed up to worship the Lord. Brian was a young man. He had friends and his brother was mentally challenged. His brother always went everywhere with him when he was a little boy. They did everything together, rode around on the bike together. But as he got older, his friends didn't want his little brother around. He was a problem. Brian used to hear his brother singing at night. As they were going to bed, he loved to sing. Simple, simple mind. But he loved Jesus. He would sing songs as they went to bed. But one day, Brian... Just in a moment, everybody was giving him... It was a bunch of peer pressure, and they were like, let's go, and he... He turned to his brother and said, why do you always follow me? I don't even like it when you're with me. And it hurt his challenged brother. And from that point on, he never sang. He lost his soul. Now, some people call others a problem. Some people say that there's things that are in my life that are a problem. I want you to know whatever you have said and whatever you have done, God can repair it. Brian was in college. He did not know that his brother stopped singing at night because he went off to college shortly after the problem happened. And he was at the university and he was going to graduate. His father got a bad report from the doctor and he came home. He was sleeping that night, and he didn't hear his brother singing like he was expecting, sleeping in his old bed back at his home. He asked Mom, he said, Mom, why why doesn't Eric sing anymore? She said, something happened about four years ago. We don't know what it was, but Eric lost his song. No, anger is not a primary emotion. You're hurt first. And you show anger second. And some people might call you a hothead. 
but really you're a hurt head. You're damaged because of something someone said, something, something, did, so, something somebody did. And you're manifesting anger in life, and you may be lashing out because hurt people hurt other people. And he realized he'd been impatient and he'd been unkind. And that night he walked up to Eric's room as they were getting ready for bed, and he said, I'm so sorry. I know it was me. I know what happened. I know what I did. And I'm so very sorry. And his brother Eric, who only had about a 13-year-old mentality, began to cry. And they hugged. And they enjoyed each other's company. And then Brian went down to bed as he's laying in his bed. Almost four and a half years later, he hears Eric singing songs to Jesus. Because the hurt had healed. What was hidden in Eric's life was brought to the surface and it was given back. He was given back health again. Even at his young mental state, he knew what it was like to have something hidden that hurt. Guys are not okay with our emotions. I can tell you that. It's easier to be mad than it is to say, I'm hurt. You want to have a good worship service? We'll hoop it up. You want to go to a sports game? Yeah, we'll, we'll holler it up. We'll have a good old time. We'll celebrate the Packers. We'll get excited about the Brewers. We can do that. But some of us are really, really bad at showing our hurts. And so almost every time I'm in this pulpit, God calls us to a hospital moment, a restoration moment, because that's what this house is. It's a restoration house. And if you've lost your song, and you've lost your joy, and you've been sitting in bed wondering, why is life just cycling on me? Why can't I find the beauty of walking with God again? There's a hidden hurt somewhere in your life, and only God can take care of it. They may never say they're sorry. You don't even know if they even re will recognize what happened. But you can take it to Jesus. And when you seek him and you lay it down, you say, Lord, I don't even know what this hurt means. I don't know what's happening. All of a sudden, you'll find a song of worship again. You'll find a joy in your heart again. You'll be living for God on another level again. You'll feel like God has changed something in you. You may not even know what the hurt was, but you will be new. Little Eric didn't know what it was. Just something wounded his spirit, and he lost his song. I'm here to preach to somebody today that you can get it all back. One trip to the cross, you can get it all back. One altar call, one moment of responding to the word, you can get it all back. And I believe it can happen today. In Jesus' name, Lord, everybody in this room, including myself, I, I, I'm part of this today. We have a tendency to hide. We have a tendency to not show the things that hurt us. And I'm praying that this altar call today brings people who are ready for change. I believe this is their day. This is their hour. We've preached long, but we've preached the word. And I pray it has its work in somebody's heart. This altar is open if you want to come. I wonder if you wouldn't bow your knee and say, Jesus, whatever it is, I don't know where it's at, but I want you to take it out of my life. I don't know where I stored it, but I put it away, and I can tell that my behavior is different because I've, I'm hiding something somewhere, and I want it gone. Would you cover me under your blood again? Would you remember, Lord Jesus, the baptism in my life, and would you wash me new? Somebody needs to let go of that title they call you the hothead. No, it's just hurt. It's just hurt. That's all it was, was just hurt. And you haven't been able to see life like you wanted to lately. You haven't been able to rejoice in others' victories. You haven't been able to celebrate even your own. You've felt like maybe something's hiding somewhere. Release it in the presence of the Lord right now. In the name of Jesus, begin to sing on your bed one more time. Begin to rejoice in the Lord one more time. Begin to celebrate the secret place where you can let things go 
where you can reach for him. And the more you seek him, the more you're going to find him. Today, in the presence of the Lord, this altar is open. If you'd step out, I promise God will meet you here. Let's respond. Come down today and pray somewhere in this altar area. I will join you. We'll pray together. Let's seek him today. It's your choice today. Will you hide or will you seek? Come out, come out wherever you are. You choose it. I want to choose seeking him, not hiding. Come on today. It's more.